Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the Help to Buy Scotland scheme is progressing. Minister Margaret Burgess. Since, since it launched in September last year, Help to Buy Scotland has helped over 1,200 house, households into home ownership. With over 160 house builders participating, the scheme is supporting Scotland's housing industry and contributing to sustainable economic growth. The Deputy First Minister announced a further £40 million of funding for Help to Buy Scotland on the 16th of May, taking total government support for the scheme to £275 million over three years. This additional funding will allow more people in Scotland to buy a new home. Gavin Brown. I am grateful for that answer. The scheme, of course, is funded via the financial transactions monies. Um, are there currently any unallocated financial transactions monies for this financial year? Sir. Um, the, it is funded by the financial transactions uh, funding, and certainly I will get uh, the Cabinet Secretary for, uh, for Finance to respond to, to Mr Brown in terms of allocated funding for this year. But what I can do is assure him that the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to the Help to Buy Scotland scheme and to help people onto the housing ladder, and we will continue that commitment to the scheme. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. For buyers to get on the property ladder, there must also be enough housing stock. The housing st statistics published by the Scottish Government this week show the number of houses built has gone down again and is at its lowest level since 1947. What is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that there are enough houses for our growing population? Minister. The Scottish Government has a, a commitment to build 30,000 affordable homes during the lifetime of this Parliament. And I would remind the member that since 2007, when this Government came, to, uh, uh, came into power in Scotland, there have been more houses built across the sector, there have been more houses built in the social sector, and per head of population in the private sector, there are still more houses being built. So Scotland is pushing above our weight in the rest of the UK in terms of house building, and we'll continue to do so. We'll looking at other innovative ways of making sure that we can continue to ensure that we are building houses for the people of Scotland and we have certainly outperformed any other administration in this Scottish Parliament. Question number two, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to include the six Black Guillemot sites, three Sandale sites and the Firth of Forth Banks complex as part of the proposed marine protected areas to be designated in 2014. Secretary Richard Lockhead. Marine Scotland are currently reviewing the 14,703 consultation responses to our consultation, almost all of which I am pleased to say were supportive of the work we are undertaking uh, and also our project partners in terms of developing the network of marine protected areas, including those 10 sites mentioned by the member. So we will be considering further scientific advice from Scottish Natural Heritage and the Joint Nature Conservation Committee. And of course, once considered, we will set out our next steps for designating a, a network of MPAs within the next few months. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that understanding how best to protect Scotland's seabirds and address their decline is of vital importance as we seek to develop Scotland's offshore renewable resource whilst also respecting our natural environment? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, clearly, I do agree with that. And of course, offshore renewables do, of course, already take a, a, account of potential impacts on, on seabirds. And these new plans and designations that are currently being considered will ensure further protection for Scotland's rich seabird uh, heritage. It's also worth bearing in mind that there are already designations in place for marine waters uh, at the moment, covering 31 seabird breeding colonies in Scotland that were, of course, designated back in 2009. Uh, but marine, marine protected areas are also being considered for the black guillemot and other species that support seabirds. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, with regards um, to Colin Beatty's specific question about designating black guillemot and sand eel MPAs, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he could uh, reassure us that he's taking into consideration with these MPAs the possibility of not just protecting but enhancing those features? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I am aware there is a, a big campaign underway to persuade the government to de designate as part of our MP8 network uh, sites that covered important seabird uh, colonies uh, and breeding areas and feeding areas. And that is why we are, as I said, considering whether 
the MPA network should take into account black guillemot and other species that support seabirds, including four sites for sand eels, which are, of course, an important food source for seabirds. So we are actively considering these designations. Jamie McGregor. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, on that point, uh, can, what further actions are being considered to turn around the worrying trends relating to the dwindling number of sand eels, um, as these are obviously an important food, very important food species, uh, thing for the seabirds? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as I just indicated, part of our current consideration of the Marine Protected Area Network will include consideration of four sites where sand eels are present, which, of course, are an important food source for seabirds. Of course, this is quite a complex situation because climate change and other factors influence our sand eel populations, but we are certainly actively considering how sand eels can be included in the MPA network. Question three, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government who sits on the working group on supporter involvement in football clubs. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The recently established working group on uh, support involvement in football clubs, chaired by Stephen Morrow, senior lecturer at Stirling University, includes representatives of the Scottish Football Association, the Scottish Professional Football League, Supporters Direct Scotland, and Sport Scotland. The group is scheduled to meet for the first time. Uh, on Friday the 30th and can, as part of its early considerations, review current membership to ensure that it has appropriate representation from clubs, supporters and the football authorities. Alison Johns. Um, thank you. Does the Minister agree that one possible solution to moving Scottish football towards fan ownership would be for the sports governing bodies to require clubs to give fans the first right to buy when they come up for sale, and that if they are unwilling to do so, this Parliament may consider legislation. Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, first of all, can I acknowledge uh, Alison Johnson's long-standing um, interest uh, in this area, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll continue to have uh, discussions uh, about this. As I've indicated previously, uh, and during the, the debate on this issue uh, last month, the governance and ownership of uh, football clubs is a complex issue that we do require to carefully consider, which is why, of course, the Working Group on Support and Involvement in Football Clubs was established. And I am confident the group will, by working closely with those involved uh, in all sides of the debate, will identify a range of possible options for change. Uh, as I said, the, the group meets for the first time tomorrow. It will look at all of these issues and they will uh, look to give recommendations uh, back uh, to me uh, by the end of this year and then we can take forward the recommendations uh, through Parliament. Question number four, Hugh Henry. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when the four-hour target for accident and emergency treatment will be met at the, uh, the Royal Alexander Ho Alexandra Hospital in Paisley. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government is working closely with NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to ensure the four-hour target for accident and emergency is met across all its sites, including the Royal Alexandra Hospital. Uh, very clearly, we have some way to go to achieve the sustainable improvement required uh, in the board area and at the Royal Alexandria. Although performance of the Royal Alexandria Hospital is improving and is often above 90%, even meeting and exceeding the 95% target, however, we appreciate more work has to be done to continue improvements towards a sustainable and ongoing 95%. Hugh Henry. Uh, President Officer, I'm disappointed that the Cabinet Secretary won't give an indication of when his target will be met. Um, President Officer, the REH was one of only two hospitals in Scotland which failed to meet even 90% of the four-hour target, according to Audit Scotland, in November and December of last year. The Cabinet Secretary intervened to protect mental health services in his own area. Can I ask, will he now take a personal interest and intervene to deliver the target for patients in Renfrewshire. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, can I tell the member that the Royal Alexandra achieved just under 92 per cent in March, which is obviously the latest official figure available. There were no waits exceeding 12 hours, and there was a 57 per cent reduction in the number waiting over eight hours, a substantial improvement on the performance when he was a minister. And the overall level in Scotland was 86 per cent, described by the then Health Secretary Andy Kerr as a very, very good performance. Uh, I had a meeting recently with the Chair and Chief Executive of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, and uh, I 
discussed with them the detailed plans we have right across the board area to ensure that that board, like every other board in Scotland, achieves the 95% target by September and then moves on to the 98% sustainable standard. Question five, Jimmy McGregor. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reverse the projected population decline in Argyll and Butte. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Training officer, the Scottish Government continues to support healthy population growth through working closely with a range of organisations, including Argyll and Butte Council and Highlands Anne's Enterprise, to promote sustainable economic growth in Argyll and Butte. This helps to ensure strong, thriving communities across the area that will retain and attract people. Population growth is a key driver of sustainable economic growth, as our government economic strategy makes clear. Jimmy McGregor. Uh, I thank you for that answer. Um, does the Minister share my concern that the recently published national records of Scotland projections suggest Argyll and Butte's population will fall by 13.5 per cent uh, by 2037? the second largest projected decline in all of Scotland, and that the working age population is predicted to fall by almost 22%. Does the Minister agree with me that attracting new jobs and investment to boost economic growth in Argyll and Butte is vital to reversing this decline, and this means the Scottish Government must redouble efforts to improve the area's infrastructure in terms of improving roads like the A83 and ensuring proper broadband is available to all areas, including the small rural communities? Cabinet Secretary. There's, I have a lot of sympathy with the points that uh, Mr McGregor uh, raises. Um, I, I'm very clear in my first answer that improving economic opportunities is critical to boosting population. Um, as part of that, what we can see in a range of different areas in the Highlands and Islands is that the uh, rollout of digital connectivity, which of course is an ongoing priority for the government, has boosted business prospects very significant, as have other measures that we have taken, such as the Small Business Bonus Scheme, which will be utilised extensively across the um, Argyll and Butte area. So the, the, the government is very much focused on ensuring that the infrastructure in rural Scotland, whether it is transport infrastructure or um, broadband connectivity, is appropriate to attract business and to support and to encourage um, population growth. Um, I will be participating later this year in a population summit um, on, the issue of a, uh, on this issue with Argyll and Butte, and I look forward to making a contribution to that event. Question six, Anzala Malik. Uh, thank you, and good morning, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to resolve issue concerning duplicate registration and management information dental accounting system so that overpayments do not occur in the future. Minister Michael Matheson. The MIDAS payment system for dentists is a matter for Practitioner Services Division. I can confirm that Practitioner Services have put in place a number of measures to resolve issues causing duplicate registrations so that overpayments do not occur in the future. Hansala Malik. Uh, Thank you for that uh, response. Since 2006, the Scottish Government own figures estimate that 3.4 million has been overpaid to NHS dentists. This is mainly caused by a series of flaws in MADAS MEDA system that are forced to use and not due to the fault of the dentists. Does the Minister agree that the sorting out of the problem should be a priority rather than punishing dentists for the error that is generated by a faulty computer system? And what actions is he going to take to ensure that this is fixed so that dentists do not suffer in the future? Minister. Well, I think it's important to understand information which is held on the MIDAS system is based upon information that's supplied by the dentists and the errors have occurred as a result of the information that was supplied by uh, dentists and included on the system. In order to reduce those errors from occurring in the future, they are now attached to the CHI number in order to reduce the risk of someone actually being put on the system as a duplicate registration. But I am sure the member will recognise that it is important that the over £3 million of overpayments that have been made to dentists have been retained within the dental budget in order to be invested within dentistry, and that that money has been used to improve Scotland's oral health record, as we have been doing for a number of years now. Make it brief, Dr Simpson. Yes, um, thank you for that answer, Minister. But the problem is that, they, that one dentist does not know that another dentist has had a patient register with them in duplicate. So it's not the patient's, it's not the dentist's fault. And, and the, 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 the system is requiring repayments over four years of this problem, which is an IT problem, to be repaid by these dentists within six weeks. Now, if you're running a business, that's really not good. And I would suggest the government have got to get this sorted properly and not punish the dentists. Minister. Well, 
I'm sure the member will recognise that the issue of overpayment uh, that's been made to dentists uh, is important that that's recovered, legally responsible for recovering that money, and that uh, you know, it can be over a longer period of time as required, and there's a process in place to allow that to happen, and Practitioner Services Division will allow that to happen where it is appropriate. But I'm sure the member will welcome the fact that all of that money has been reinvested in NHS dental care provision in Scotland, which is a positive step to make sure that we continue to improve oral health care in Scotland. Question 7, Gil Patterson. Hey, can I ask the Scottish Government, when it last met with uh, Police Scotland, and what, it, what was discussed? Cabinet Secretary Ken McCaskill. Uh, I last met with representatives of Police Scotland at the public launch of the National Code of Ethics for Policing in Scotland, held yesterday at the Scottish Police College. I was delighted to support this important development, which sees Police Scotland's values of integrity, fairness and respect firmly placed at the heart of our nation's policing. Gil Patterson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? As the Cabinet Secretary is aware, a young woman from my constituency, Regan McCall, died in February after taking an illegal substance in a nightclub. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, to outline the measures that the Police Scotland and the Scottish Government indeed can take to ensure that this tragic incident is not repeated. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. Can I first of all uh, say that I think the sympathy of everybody in the Chamber goes to the family of young Reagan McCall. It's a tragedy for anyone so young to lose their lives, especially in that manner. Taking any drug carries risks because it's impossible to know its contents and effects on your health, whether sold as legal or not. And we'd urge the public to heed warnings about the dangers of taking drugs. And we've made significant investment in our substance misuse education programme to ensure that credible, accurate and timely information is available to help people make informed choices about their health. But we are anxious to change even the name legal highs when these are in fact psychoactive substances that can kill, as we have seen. Parliament has backed plans by the Community Safety Minister to work with our partners in Scotland and the UK Government to combat the supply and misuse of such new drugs at the first debate in Parliament on this issue. And there is an ambitious programme for substance misuse education, and our drugs campaign, Know the Score, continues to offer reliable and non judgmental advice on drugs and their risks. Question 8, Mary Scanlon. I ask the Scottish Executive when a new prison will be built in the Highlands to replace Porterfield Prison in Inverness. Cabinet Secretary Ken McCaskill. Discussions between Highland Council and the Scottish Prison Service are underway regarding an appropriate location for HMP Highland. Until these discussions are satisfactorily concluded, a date and location for the construction of the prison cannot be confirmed. However, as noted in the Scottish Government Infrastructure Investment Plan 2011, it remains SPS's ambition to deliver HM Prison Highland as a replacement for HM Prison Inverness during 2019. Mary Scanlon. Uh, the Deputy Justice Minister criticised the uh, Labour Justice Secretary in 2003 of burying her head in the sand and not addressing the consistent overcrowding in Inverness Prison. In 2009, we, we were promised a jail Scanlon? with a price tag of £40 million. So when will it be built and how many prisoners will it hold? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the number of prisons, prisoners it will hold will matter for the Scottish Prison Service. I can confirm, as I say, it's budgeted for 2019 and the Scottish Prison Service are working actively uh, with Highland Council to ensure that the right and appropriate site can be discovered. What I can say is that it will certainly not cost in the region of the near £1 billion that has been paid by the taxpayer for Adiwell Prison. It's budgeted to cross approximately £60 million in construction costs, uh, following on the £80 million construction costs for HM Prison Grampian. Uh, the Scottish taxpayer will not be funded with the huge expense that they're having to place, pay for the burden of the PFI PPP prisons. Dave Thompson, briefly. Yeah, would the Cabinet Secretary agree that an integrated justice centre uh, would be a good idea when planning a new prison for the Highlands, encompassing all of the elements of the justice system on one site? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we strongly support measures that enable justice organisations to work together and ensure modern and uh, efficient facilities. I think the member makes a good point, and I have no doubt it is a matter that will be borne in mind not simply by the Scottish Prison Service, but also by the Scottish Court Service, who ultimately would have to engage and deal with matters. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for